Well, this is awkward. Where's the preacher? I mean, the preacher's going to preach. He needs to preach where the preachers preach. And that's like, you know, in front of everyone. Where, why is he not here? Where are you? That same question is what God's people were asking when he took them out of the promised land. He led them away by their enemies into lands that were foreign. And they were wondering, God, where are you? But now we're in the part of the story where Haggai speaks. He's the first prophet that comes to God's people when they're returning from exile. When they're coming back to the land God promised them. He's returning them. He's beginning to restore them, to rebuild the temple. And God speaks through this guy called Haggai, which sounds a little weird to our ears. And he tells them, he gives them this promise in the midst of everything he's written. He says, my spirit remains in your midst. Wow. Lord, some, some of our elders, some of our old ones, they saw, the, they saw Solomon's temple. They saw the first temple. Maybe even some of them saw your glory fill the temple in the form of a cloud. How do we know you're with us? How do we know you're in our midst? And God gives them another promise. I got chapter two, verse nine. And when God's glory is hidden, we have his promises. And he says this, the latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place, I will give peace, declares the Lord of hosts. It's talking about the temple that's being built. And that's why God sent this remnant back from the exile to, to begin to rebuild and he's doing that because he made promises to the people that they were going to go into exile, but he, God would bring them back. And now he's being faithful and beginning to bring them back. And, and he gives this promise to his people. The glory of this house will be greater than the former, the former house, Solomon's temple. Now why would, Haggai, why would God have Haggai say that? Well, it's because the house, the temple, this next temple that's being built is smaller. It's not made from the same stuff the old temple was, the cedars of Lebanon. These great, this huge, this amazing wood. And I don't know if any of you are woodworkers and are particular about, you know how some wood is more precious than others, but be that as it may, some wood is. And the cedars of Lebanon, it was known around the world at that time. And that's what the temple used to be made out of. But not this temple. This temple is going to be smaller. It's going to be less. It's not going to be as glorious as Solomon's temple. In fact, to the point where another guy, a priest that returned with God's people, Ezra, uh, recorded this reaction from some of the people. In Ezra chapter 3, verse 12 he writes this, but many of the priests and Levites and the heads of their father's houses, the old men who had seen the first house, Solomon's temple, wept with a loud voice when they saw the foundation of this house being laid, though many shouted aloud with joy. So there are a lot of people that were rejoicing at this foundation finally being laid, God fulfilling his promise yet again. And yet even as that was happening and there were some people rejoicing, there were others who remembered what it was like before and saw even from the foundation, this wasn't going to be as great. This wasn't going to be as glorious. And they wept. When you see something and it reminds you of how things used to be, <clears throat> what makes you weep? When you're in the midst of darkness, what causes you to ask God, where are you? 
<coughs> Excuse me. Because God's glory, at one time, it filled the temple in the form of a cloud. God's glory filled the room. There was, there was nothing else that could be in the temple because God's glory in that place was so great. And it was the same cloud <coughs> that followed God's people from Egypt to the promised land, from slavery to freedom. God was present with his people all the way through. Excuse me, one moment. <coughs> A little tickle. Preaching three times, preaching three times, I'll do this to you. <coughs> so God was with his people in the form of a cloud. Not sim- the cloud didn't symbolize God's presence. He was present. He went with them through the wilderness, through the desert, to this land he had promised them. And he stayed with them there. And all the more, when a few hundred years later, when Solomon built that temple, his glory filled it. But now, when God's people rebelled, there's no cloud. There's his prophets, but there's no cloud. God, where are you? When you get to a point in this era, in this day and age, in your life now, What makes you say, what makes you ask, God, where are you? And then, how do you you still believe when it seems like God has hidden himself from you? Solomon knew a bit about this experience. He wrote Psalm 30, and in verse 7 of Psalm 30, he writes these words. He says, by your favor, O Lord, you made my mountain strong. You hid your face. I was dismayed. To you, O Lord, I cry, and to the Lord I plead for mercy. Do you see that? There's a promise God gave David and Solomon. But Solomon knows from experience there are times where God hides his face from them. Those times in our lives where God seems anywhere but here. Those times in our life where it's easy to doubt. Or, or maybe it's when you're reading God's word and you've read it before and you've read it before and you've read it before and all of a sudden this, this word is supposed to be bringing you life. It's boring. You just, meh, I've read that before. I know what it says. God hasn't changed. What changed? My heart My heart changed. My heart becomes hard to God's presence, to his glory. Because, yeah, we don't have a cloud right now that fills the room, but we do have God's word. God's word is what brings his glory to you, into your heart, into your mind. And it's through that word that God takes things that are less than, like water, or things like bread and wine, and he fills it with his glory, with his word that communicates to you, it brings to you power. Or like in baptism, God gives you his spirit through word and through the water and through communion, through his word and through body or through bread and wine, he gives you body and blood, forgiveness all over again. But like Israelites wandering through the desert for 40 years, and that cloud's just hanging out like it has the last 40 years. Yeah, that's just God doing his thing, used to it. Kind of bored with it by now, actually. When's he going to do something new? When's he really going to wow me? As if God putting his spirit in water or his power, his body and blood and bread and wine wasn't amazing enough. But our hearts get hard. So we need something. We need something outside of ourselves to break through our hard hearts and our short attention spans. And so God's glory reveals what I need. God's glory reveals what I need. Maybe, you've, maybe you're new to faith and you're just beginning to, to read through God's word, the scriptures. Uh, or maybe you've read through it a few times already. Maybe you've read it all your life and you, you think you know it pretty well. You've read this verse from 
Colossians chapter 1 before, right? He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Blah, 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 blah. But when we do that, we miss the mission The whole reason Jesus came to this place as a human, God took on human flesh. He didn't just appear to be human. He actually is and was human. And he did that to move you from a kingdom of, from a domain domain of darkness to a kingdom of his son, kingdom of Jesus. I don't feel that all the time. So how do I know? How can I believe that that actually happens when it seems like the world is pretty dark around me? Do you believe that God has transferred you from a domain of darkness to the kingdom of his his son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins? Do you believe that? How and why? Especially when there are multiple explanations why things are happening that have very little or nothing to do with God. And they seem to make sense. Why would you still believe this word from God? Luke chapter 2, Luke writes this account of Jesus' story. And there's a man named Simeon. And Simeon, it had been revealed to him, I'm kind of doing a preamble here to this, uh, it had been revealed to Simeon that he would not die until he held, until he beheld, looked on Yahweh's Messiah, the anointed one, the Savior. Right? So the Spirit had revealed this to him. And he, Simeon, came in the Spirit into the temple. And when, he, when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, Simeon, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, you are, le- you are now letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. Now, how in the world, out of all the kids that were being presented that day, how in the world did Simeon know this child was the one? God's spirit revealed it to him. The same spirit that opened the disciples' hearts and minds who before Jesus rose from the dead didn't understand why he was there, didn't understand God's mission. They completely missed what he was doing even though God told them, Jesus told them more than once what he was here to do. Still didn't get it until the spirit opened their hearts and minds to believe And that same spirit worked in Simeon's heart and mind to know that this baby he was holding in his hands, he was actually holding God's salvation, God's glory in his hands in the temple. And that's why we believe God's word, because he is faithful. That same word he spoke to Haggai centuries before, that his temple The the glory of this temple would exceed the glory of Solomon's temple. Why? Because God himself was present in it. Jesus was there. And so the glory of that temple was way more than anything Solomon could ever have done. And that same spirit that revealed things to Solomon and to Haggai and to Simeon and to the disciples, is at work in you. That's that same spirit God gives us in baptism. That word powerfully at work on your and my cold and and hardened hearts, breaking through to help you believe the promises of God. So when God says in Haggai chapter 2, verse 5, the, the second half of that verse, he says, my spirit remains in your midst. The call is, to believe. Do you believe God is in your midst right now? Do you believe that God forgives your sins for the sake of Jesus? Believe 
live. Something else God calls his people to do. He makes it real simple. <laughs> he says, work in Haggai chapter 2. Because he, he freed them from exile. He restored them to his kingdom to rebuild his temple. God has not given us that work to do. He has given us other work to do. To follow him, to gather in his name. Yes, that's what we're supposed to be doing. Absolutely. But to take what God has given you, his spirit, his word today, his glory that is coming to you today, that lives within you today, to take it out, to share that word with somebody else that needs it. Because there's a whole world out there. Neighborhoods, families, homes, filled with people that are following any other explanation other than God. But you are filled with the glory of God. You are filled with the Spirit of God to take this life-changing, heart-breaking word to them so that they may believe and receive that same forgiveness that we have as God transfers us from a domain of darkness into the kingdom of his son Jesus. In his name, amen. Because of what God has done, because of his love and his word that comes and changes our hearts and our minds over and over and over again. Let's take a moment to reflect on that word that he gives us, to respond to our God who sees us and reveals himself all over again.